Thank you again, team, for that. Way to go, Adrian, on that song. When you listen to the words of that song, there is no wonder that Brenda is so excited to be able to share through her life uh, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And Brenda, I should just have you do the whole message today, you know. <laughs> but no, you're stuck with me, folks. <clears throat> again, I'm Juno, and I am thrilled that you are here. Uh, Brenda mentioned the top five, and, and I've asked the staff and the, and the board to be thinking about, uh, and you to be thinking about five people. Five people through Lent that you can be praying for. Five people that, who are far from God, who are either ticked at the church, angry at the church, who are apart from the church. Five people that you can be praying for throughout these next, whatever's left of Lent. Not quite 40 days now. And not just to be praying for them, but to be praying that God will open up a window of conversation, a window of opportunity, just in your own natural way. You may not be making candies and putting a thing uh, like Brenda does. That's okay. But just what is a natural way for you to invite people to join us on Easter morning? And so be thinking about that. You know, write them down. Put them on a three-by-five card. Put them on a post-it. Put them on a bathroom mirror. I would say your, your rearview mirror at the car, but that may be too distracting. Put them someplace, wherever you need to, to remember and to be praying for those people. Well, folks, we are in our series called A New Way to Be Human. Again, it's on the Sermon on the Mount. It's in the book of Matthew. It's on page 677 in those Bibles in front of you. Again, if you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take that Bible. Uh, but we're, we're talking about one of the most famous sermons that Jesus ever said. We're talking about one of the most famous sermons, in fact, some of the things that Jesus says has been said before. In many of the ancient uh, manuscripts and writings, many of these things have been said. So it really reminds me of, of my, one of my professors back at Wheaton Graduate School who said, God doesn't give extra credit for originality. Some of the things that Jesus was saying has been said before. And Jesus isn't intimidated by that. He isn't insecure about that. As we led up to this point, we're reminded that Jesus, you know, grabbed four or five guys. Some of his closest followers, or would be his closest followers, to be a part of the team. People who were hardworking, people who were committed, people who were diligent, people were, who were a team player to be a part of the team that was going to change the world. And then this famous passage of Jesus, this famous sermon, really talks about some of the most, uh, some of the desires of, of many of you. Many of you who are in the workforce who are just a little shy to stand up. Many of you who interact with people each and every day. Because you, uh, this, this sermon mentions, uh, brings up the point that as Jesus wanted to, to change the world, so do you. And this sermon just brings out ways that that can happen. And while it's one of the most famous sermons of Jesus, it's also the sermon that he really turned things upside down and presented again a new way to be human. Now, folks, it's, it's interesting that uh, in this, again, Jesus is talking and he's blessing the oppressed. He's, a, he's blessing the poor. He's, he's talking about their willingness. He, he blesses their willingness to wait on God for, ju for justice and for righteousness. He blesses them as they step into issues and into, into, into areas that, uh, that normally they wouldn't step into because they're, because they're trying to, uh, to bring about this new peace. And so it's also important for us to remember that there is absolutely nothing wrong with power. There is nothing wrong with, with positions. There is nothing wrong with affluence. Not a thing with it. It goes back to really a lot of what we're talking about. The idea of where is your heart. And that's what Jesus is narrowing in this, this whole sermon on. It's is not about everything out here, but what about here? And so while we talk about the poor in spirit and the oppressed, we're not saying that those who have 
are not blessed, that they do not have the peace that passes all understanding. And I think that's important because at times I've heard the flip side of that. But again, as we look at, uh, at, the, at the Beatitudes, you'll, you'll see them on the back of your program again. What we see is that blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and justice. And why the promises we hear is because for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They should be comforted. They shall inherit the earth. They shall be filled with a peace that only Christ can give as he changes their hearts and their lives from the inside out. And to think that's only the first four of the Beatitudes. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, again for, for your presence here in this place. Thank you again for everybody who's, who, who's come into here. And I know they come in here, with, Lord, with, with different uh, feelings on their hearts. Feelings toward the person next to them, maybe. Maybe some frustration with you, God, for, for whatever reason. Maybe their anger. Maybe they're still searching and trying to figure this whole thing out. Maybe, Lord God, they have been a, a follower of you for 50 and 60, 70, 80, and even 90 years. And so we are grateful that you have brought us together into this place as your community. And so I pray that the, the thoughts of each heart this morning, that the distractions that may be just flying around in their mind, Lord, that you'll help them to focus in. I pray that the words that I share will be acceptable in your sight because you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So blessed, we start today with blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. It's verse 7, but it's the fifth beatitude. A guy named Myron Augsburger writes, the Hebrew word for mercy expresses the unique quality of the everlasting mercy of God. The word carries a meaning of, of identification to the suffering of others or going through something with another person or entering into another person's problem with understanding and acceptance. And this is what God did for us in Christ. He identified with humanity and he suffered on behalf of our sin. And mercy is a interesting beatitude. While we're all called to have mercy, I know at times it's not big on my list. When I worked at the university, I had to fire a student uh, worker. He was what we call an RA. He was in charge of 50 people. And we had a drinking policy. And even if you were 21, you could not have somebody under 21 in the room with alcohol. And he did. And so I called him in, and he knew what was going to happen. But he goes, but you know, I'm a Christian too. I was aware of that. He was on a campus ministry team. He was a leader on that team. And I knew that. And because I had to make the tough decision of saying, you know, you can reapply next semester, but for this semester, your ministry here is done. I don't think he thought I had much mercy. And while I wanted to let it slide, because really, what the kid wasn't drinking, there was just a, you know, but we had to be very strict because of the abuse of alcohol in the uh, state, well, probably in any university, Christian or not, but in any, uh, with college kids. And so I held that line tight. And so at times I wondered, now, do I have mercy or don't I? And it's important that as, as the Beatitudes uh, 
where we, is this one here starts to shift from not just, as we've read earlier, not just being poor in spirit or mourned, not just things that are happening to me, but mercy starts to shift a little bit of how I'm responding to others, how I am interacting with the people God puts in my life. So as we go through the rest of the Beatitudes this morning, the Beatitudes isn't a call to live lives of isolation. It isn't a call to, to, to be dressed up in a, in a robe, but to be, uh, be interacting with the people that God brings us in contact with. But it, is, it isn't easy. It isn't easy to live out what it means to be merciful. The Beatitudes, the idea again of, 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 of focusing on our inside eventually changes us on the outside. And that's what is, has been so encouraging as I've studied through these and read through these. That is really, it really is a call to action and a new way to be human. And as we, we do show, show mercy, God says we shall obtain it. And I think for those of us who have experienced who Jesus is, have experienced his love and his mercy, it is easier to show it to others. In fact, we probably could we probably become much more merciful as we realize that without God's grace and his love and mercy to us, we would be absolutely nothing. But yet, I think as believers, it's easy for us uh, to think it, it really is about me. And again, that classic song that we sang this morning, which I love, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It doesn't end there. If God's amazing grace is just for me, we have short-sailed the gospel. And so I'm reminded of that as I once again look at what it means to be merciful. And I think our challenge is, let's be honest, is that while why we believe God has indeed changed us, transformed us. And we all know we're on a journey, we're not perfect, and we're all messed up in some way or another. But at times, those of us within a local congregation, we can cop an attitude. We can all of a sudden think this is really my faith. Jesus died for me, and we become very, very judgmental and finger-pointing at everybody that doesn't quite do something or live a life the way we think it ought to be lived. And so as we go forward through Lent, may God be, be, be prodding your heart to be merciful to others. Blessed are the verse 8, the sixth beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. Now, when you think of that word, word, uh, pure in heart, when you think of those words, simply think of integrity. You know, sometimes uh, I picked up a prescription this week, and my insurance company's no longer going to cover it, so they have something over the counter. And the first thing they w said was, this is just as good as the name brand. It's, uh, everything in there is at the same level, the same consistency. You have nothing to worry about. They really wanted to convince me that this new drug, which supposedly is cheaper, uh, is, is a drug of integrity, that it's It's solid. I can trust in it. And so blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew, who wrote this chapter, is often talking about integrity. 
He talks about, later on in the chapter, about the narrow way leads to destruction and how you have to choose one way or another. You have to be a person of integrity. It talks about uh, uh, people being pure in heart. Somebody who, who loves God and is he staying on course with God. Matthew just talks, these things are woven in between. So on your own, finish reading out Matthew. And you can see how Matthew talks about integrity, pure of heart, not serving two masters. Studies will show us that people do not come to a church, or they claim it's the younger generation. They don't like the church because it's, uh, people are fake. People are, are not uh, people aren't transparent, and they lack integrity. And I don't know you, but I've been around enough people that when people lack integrity, sooner or later, you see it. I've been around people that have strung a web of lies so thick they don't know when they're telling the truth. So again, Jesus reminds us to have a pure heart, to live a life of integrity. And I know the studies say it's the younger generation who are not coming to church because of that lack, but my guess is even for us who are older, in our 50s, I'm still in there, 60s, 70s, and beyond, many of you, you want people you want friendships, you want relationships, you want a spouse who is a person of integrity. I don't think it's an age difference here. I just think it's, it's how we live our life and the Beatitudes. Putting on a, 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 way, a new way to be human, integrity needs to be a part of that. And let's take a look, folks, at, at, at uh, verse 9, the seventh Beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Peacemakers are not, on, not only live peaceful lives, but they also try to bring peace. Now, this is a, a challenging word for us to wrestle through. Because I think when we think peacemakers, we think of somebody who's just going to keep the peace. When you're planning Easter dinner, Who's going to make sure Uncle Louie doesn't go off the deep end on something? Who's going to keep the peace with Uncle Louie or Aunt Susie? Keep the peace at work so you don't maybe bring up anything because you think you don't like conflict, and so you want to keep the peace. Well, here we're, talk, we're told that we, blessed are the peacemakers. And again, the peace we're talking about isn't necessarily an outward peace at times but the inward peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who build relationships with others so that they, at the right time, in a natural way, and in a way of integrity, share with them who Jesus is so that they can experience the ultimate peace. So blessed are the peacemakers, really, folks? Should this really say in our modern language... Blessed are the evangelist. Blessed are those of you who go out of your way to make relationships with our neighbors, with your friends, even with Uncle Louie, who you wish wouldn't show up at Easter. God is calling us to, how can we uh, dance around the issues? Been there, done that, folks. So that somehow, some way, Uncle Louie can see Jesus in you. So when something hits the fan in Uncle Louie's life, he is going to call you because he has seen the peace that Jesus has brought to you. Now it says in here, blessed are the peacemakers. My wondering is, what about the peace breakers? We all know the peace breakers. So in any of your relationships, spouse, children, colleagues at work, Friends, people here in the church, are you a peace breaker? And if Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, 
I'm wondering what's happening to the peace breakers. Are you not experiencing his peace? And the peace that only he can give. So as we, we think again about these Beatitudes, again, the first of them, you know, uh, inward focused, as we work through these folks, it's becoming more clear that it's really not just about me, but about those who God calls me to interact with. And it really is easier said than done, but it really is a new way to be human. And so whatever our relationships are, a peacemaker is what we, what Adrian just sang that song. Our, is our heart, are our ears tuned in to the people around us to have a redeeming influence? Again, doesn't mean everything you're going to, you have to agree on everything. There are some things in life you just got to disagree on. But that doesn't mean you're not a peacemaker. Because ultimately, your desire is to be able to, to be that light, that light that, that God wants us to be. And then the Beatitudes end with, with several verses, verses 10 through 12. And it says, Blessed are, th are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Again, the, the nature of this persecution that Jesus talks about implies a driving, chasing away, as well as actual harm. And so when we think of persecution, here it talks about uh, the, the word revile in there, verse 11. It, that's really a negativeness. That's really negative words, untrue words, gossip, folks. And so part of persecution is because of your faith, people will say things that are not true. And yet, because of your faith, you will be physically, potentially persecuted. And it's really for the sake of Jesus. So if I have a flat tire on the way to work today, and I didn't, I'm not being persecuted for my faith. I'm being reminded, duh, I should have bought some new tires. I should have watched out for the pothole. All of our family and friends back on the East Coast, freezing in snow that is who knows how deep now. You know, that isn't their cross to bear. Well, it is because they live out there, but it has nothing to do with their faith. It's life. If I bounce a check, it has nothing to do with my faith. Oops, I better be a better accountant on what comes in and what comes out of my checkbook. So often I think we, we take normal events in life and we turn those into, that's, we're being persecuted. My wife dies of cancer, it has nothing to do with my faith. Your kids say, what's the term? Speak to the hand because I'm not listening or whatever that is. Obviously, my daughter, well, maybe she said that a couple times. But anyway, uh, you know, uh, some of that is just their choices and our choices. But when, when, when Jesus talks about being persecuted, it is for his sake. And so as we, we live our lives, let us, let us remember that it's just not for us and that uh, we will be persecuted. A week ago, we heard the troubling, the very troubling, deeply troubling news about the 21 Coptic Christians that were massacred. They were murdered. They were persecuted. For many of us, it, we didn't, didn't skip a beat in our routines. 
our life went on as if nothing happened. For some of you, if you don't watch TV, or if you're not uh, 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 all over the internet, that may have been new news to you today. And for others, it isn't some political ploy. It isn't some, some uh, fancy artwork or, or drama uh, creating a, a clip for some political propaganda. For many people, uh, the, the persecution wasn't reserved just for the people that walked with Jesus. But it really is happening now. It's a tragedy, and it's happening right in front of our eyes. So we light 21 candles at the communion table in memory of those whose culture may be different, whose traditions are different, but nonetheless, nonetheless, because they were simply trying to earn a living, because of their faith, they lost their lives. And, and the irony of it is, and in losing their lives, they see heaven. So as we review the Beatitudes, we are reminded again, folks, that it goes from, uh, from an inward change to extending the peace to others, to for some people, losing their lives for Jesus. God says, blessed are the poor in spirit. The world says, blessed are the type A or overachievers. God says, blessed are those who mourn. The world says, blessed are those who are strong and stoic. Jesus says, blessed are the meek. We say, blessed are the powerful. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. The world says, blessed are those who are self-sufficient. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. The world says, blessed are those who have a strong backbone. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. But we say, blessed are the movers and shakers. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And we say, blessed are those who speak their peace of mind. And Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for his sake. But we say, blessed are those who survive and make well in society and fit in like everybody else. We're going to continue to worship as, as the band comes out here. They're going to, they're going to lead us in, in, in a response time here. And our response time here at New Life is really a time for you to respond in a way that God may be leading you. And that may be by standing and singing, by sitting where you're at, by being in prayer. It may be by coming up and lighting a candle in, in honor of somebody. Lighting a candle to, re, to remind yourself that the light of Christ maybe needs to go into one of your friends. So you light a candle for that. Maybe you want to celebrate what Christ has done uh, through his sacrifice. Maybe you need to pray with somebody in the, in the back prayer area. Or maybe you need to go and Nail your concern to the cross. Nail your concern of how God has touched your life and how you need to respond to him. But we are reminded from God's word of a new way to be human. And depending on our own journey and personality, we pick up and we resonate with the different characteristics and the different values that we have read in this chapter in Matthew. Again, a week ago, we were shocked if you heard about, again, those 21 who lost their lives. And yet we continue with our routines. Yet in our own country, in parts of our communities, and throughout the world, thousands of women continue to be exploited by pornography for the illusion of a higher standard of living. Yet their self-respect and their lives are being sold off as well as untold marriages and families being impacted by that industry. Sex trafficking is at an epidemic and women of all different ages continue to be treated like objects, possessions, and abused in many places 
and in many homes. Shades of Grey grossed over $90 million so far. But somehow that's considered art. And, and it's, while it may be a fantasy, it fuels the fire of the distorted images of relationships of women and about how God wants intimacy to be in marriage. American Sniper will hit $300 million in sales. Yet we continue to fight wars that we can't even put a price on when it comes to lives lost, to families torn apart, and the sacrifices that are made. you think someone could come up with a new way to be human. Millions suffer from hunger. Many die each day from it, yet we supersize everything to the point of sinful gluttony. Thousands are dying from cancer, yet our government continues to allow foods and pesticides to flood our markets, undoubtedly triggering and perpetuating massive destructive illnesses. Racism continues to rob the multitudes of their personal dignity and strip them of careers and pull them apart from how God intended people to live. Yet it continues in our neighborhoods, despite the words of Jesus, to find a new way to be human. And many here have been discriminated against at work, at school, because you have taken the upper road. Because you didn't laugh at the sexist or the racist joke. Because you didn't make fun of somebody in the office or in the hallway. Some of you have lost friends. Some of your family disowned you. Some of you are no longer uh, uh, one of the in crowd at the office. Because you have chosen not to participate in behaviors that were unhealthy and simply unbiblical. You've lost promotions, you've lost the big sale because you've chosen a new way to be human. And as we again take a biblical stand in our culture and in the context of the world which we live in, we often enter that, that role of being persecuted because of the faith that we have. And through the promises we read in God's word, we are reminded that our ultimate peace comes from Jesus and that God's faithfulness gives us hope in a very mysterious way that it is well with our soul.